morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rolf Kinder. I'm the founding director of the USC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And I welcome you here for the first public lecture in our new premises of the Shaw Foundation at the Library Fourth Floor. Um, I'm especially delighted that the first public lecture is featuring our this year's Sarah and Asa Shapiro Scholar in Residence, the renowned Holocaust Jewish history and gender historian Barry Kaplan. Um, we are delighted to welcome all of you here in these new premises, uh, both in person but also via, uh, via live stream here. And uh, I wanted to start with um, saying that this academic event marks the fifth anniversary of the founding of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research, which is the academic arm of the UC Shaw Foundation. Um, we are proud that in only five years, the Center has gained a widespread international recognition for the uniqueness of its programs, its resources, and its approach. Uh, it's because of this uniqueness, which uh, you can read more in the brochures, uh, which are totally uh, hot of the press right now under your seats, um, that the Center's program has now attracted over 200 scholars from all over the world, junior and senior, uh, from uh, a variety of different disciplines. And uh, in celebration of this milestone, the first five years of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research, we are delighted to share a video about the work of the Center. Every single year, it seems, our work has hardly even begun, and there's no end in sight. Since the Holocaust, genocide has continued to occur all over the world, in a variety of different countries and for a variety of different reasons. We simply have not learned enough. The USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, where steps, both incremental and monumental, will be made in this march to make never again a reality. The world needs the center because if we want to understand the world that we live in, research is essential. For the average person, university research can sound a little highfalutin, a little ivory tower. So what we try to do, we try to anchor our research in real world problems. What are the things that we identify in the countries and the genocides that we study that really impact real people? They knock down the door with an ax, they threw bricks into the windows, and then they came in. They destroyed everything that they could see. I grew up in East Germany in a communist dictatorship and experienced a lot of uh, discrimination against certain groups. I tried to make my life dedicated to actually understand why is this really happening? What are the factors influencing people? That's my mission for my personal upbringing. All it takes is to open a newspaper and read the headlines about things happening all over the world to understand the resonance that the research that happens at the center has with current day issues that are affecting all of us. Whether it is us versus them rhetoric, acts of violent extremism. The testimonies in the Visual History Archive that researchers come here to consult and research with have things to teach us about these events that are happening right now. We can't break the cycle that leads to mass violence until we understand it. Scholars from all over the world come to the center to do research. We are connecting and collaborating with a lot of scholars within USC. We also cooperate and connect with a lot of institutions beyond USC. In a very few short years, the Center for Advanced Genocide Research has got quite remarkable global reach. Everything we do 
our annual international conferences, our research fellowships, our workshops for graduate students, our trainings about the archive around the world, all ultimately contribute to deepening our understanding of the origins, the dynamics, and the consequences of genocide and mass violence. The center advances research with access to unique collections, not just the Visual History Archive, but also the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Collection, containing tens of thousands of books and rare documents. You're going to see lawyers and geographers and political science, musicologists and psychologists and all of these different disciplines working together. I can really see how access, the possibility of access to the archive, changes the scholarship that people do. I've written poems that are inspired directly by um, the survivors' experiences. The collaboration that happens around the center is a really important factor because data sets on their own don't solve problems and archives don't solve problems. What solves the problems is when people of like mind bring their skills and come together to find solutions and then take those back to their own universities in their own countries and apply that in practice. That's what makes the center really amazing. I think the center often surprises scholars but also lay people by its comparative approach and a lot of people are also very thankful that we not just look at Europe but also at other parts of the world. I'm in Guatemala to help lead some strategic discussions about the research and educational potential of testimonies about the Guatemalan genocide that appear in the Visual History Archive. Testimony can confirm what we think we know, it can challenge it, it can complicate it, it can change it. Normally, academia is not the first place people think of uh, to donate money, but all what the center does is in the long run aimed at the prevention of uh, mass violence. Supporting the Center for Advanced Genocide Research makes a direct contribution to the prevention of genocide in the future because this knowledge, this research, is going to arm us for the future. My vision is that in five years, scholars see the testimonies as essential to research on genocide and mass violence, that they wouldn't dream of conducting research without consulting the 55,000 experts in our archive. Many people get to know exactly what happened through the stories of survivors. It is time for people to recognize that the world is made out of many, many different people. Uno tiene oportunidad de aprender y en ese aprendizaje oportunidad de compartir con los que lo necesitan. There is such tremendous potential. The world now has a beacon of hope in breaking the cycle that leads to mass violence. So everything what we do, uh, the groundbreaking research we foster, our interdisciplinary focus and uh, global reach, our attention to neglected topics uh, in the study of Holocaust and genocide, and the opportunities we create for um, scholars at our annual conferences and our growing fellowship program. Uh, these are all made possible by uh, entities I want to thank, for example, first and foremost, the Shaw, UC Shaw Foundation itself, then the UC Dornside College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences, and also uh, through the support of the UC Shaw Foundation, the Board of Councillors, and the Next Generation Council, some of whom, whom uh, some of the members uh, are here with us in person, while others are joining us via live stream. Um, and I say this because um, Mickey Shapiro, one of the longtime members of the board, endowed these Sarah and Asa Shapiro Scholar in Residence Fellowship in 2015. He not only supports what we do, but he's also part of our endeavor. And we greatly benefit from his tireless commitment and participation. Thank you, Mickey. And this is uh, the moment where I'd like to uh, introduce you to the Andrew, Jay, and Anna Finzi Viterbi UC Shaw Foundation Executive Director, Stephen Smith, to say a few words.
to thank you so much uh, for convening this today, uh, for leading the uh, Centre of Advanced Genocide Research uh, so ably throughout the year um, with many programmes, and also to your staff, to Dr. Martha Stroud, and to uh, Dr. Bandin, and to Isabella. Uh, thank you for all that you do throughout the year. It's really, really appreciated. Um, to Mickey Shapiro, we know you're out there, Mickey. Uh, we know you're watching this online, if not right now, after your day's work in Detroit. Uh, we want to say to you, thank you. Uh, thank you for supporting the USC Show Foundation and for this particular lecture. Um, but also to say, um, you know, this is a, a lecture in the name of your parents, Asa and Sarah Shapiro, both Holocaust survivors, both who survived in the Ukraine, um, and who made a tremendous mark on their uh, city of Detroit in their lifetime, but are continuing now in their memory blessed memory, uh, to leave their mark on this institute through this um, lecture every year. Uh, thank you, Mickey. Really appreciate it. Um, earlier today, um, Marion Kaplan and I had a little conversation, and she said something to me which is going to stick with me. I am sure she's going to say a lot in the next uh, 45 minutes. It will also stick with, with all of us. Um, but it was really um, about the power of individual story and what we learn about humanity. And I was very touched by something she may, may even say a little bit later, but how she talked about how poor people with no real understanding of what was happening in the, in the world and in the globe at the time in which Jewish refugees were fleeing did small acts of kindness for these people that they encountered that perhaps could not necessarily, they would never know that this scholar would then later 75 years later, come across those small acts of kindness and identify something so important about how we live in our world today. Um, some of the work that the centre has been doing uh, recently has been in Bangladesh around the, the experience of the Rohingya. And when I was there um, last year with some of our colleagues, uh, one of the things that I identified in a very similar way, which is probably one of the most touching things I saw, was that there were all these agencies there, all supplying all these food and these tents and these sewage and these wells and all the things that the UNHCR turns up and does. And in the midst of this enormous um, operation, a, a gentleman turned up in a little van. He'd driven over seven hours overnight, and in that van were sacks of rice. So I talked to him and said, because these, otherwise there were trucks coming in, there were containers coming in from the, from the port, and there's this man with a van. I said, uh, what, what are you doing? Why are you here? He said, well, I collected all this rice from my community. And I just drove down to bring it here for these people. He said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to collect another band of rice and I'm going to come back next week and next week until these people don't have food sorted anymore. This is somebody that had absolutely no resources whatsoever. He didn't know the people in front of him. He had absolutely no obligation to them whatsoever, and he'd driven through the night to make sure that their kids got fed. And in our conversation this morning, when I heard what you were sharing, Mary, and you sparked that for me, um, my principal reason for, it, for being here is not just to say thank you for being here and being a star in residence this week, but thank you for the work you do in shining a light. Um, on humanity through your work. And uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you here this week, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say right now. Mary and Catherine, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, for those who don't know Mary Kaplan, I want to introduce uh, Mary Kaplan uh, who is our uh, Sarah and Exa Shapiro Scholar in Residence uh, this year. Um, Mary Kaplan is uh, the Skirvel Professor of Modern Jewish History at New York University. She, uh, and I say this uh, for the many students who are here, she did a, a, got her BA in, uh, as a double major in German Literature and History at Rutgers University and then uh, moved on to get an MA and a PhD at Columbia University in Modern European History. Before she uh, uh, moved on to uh, NYU, she uh, briefly taught at Columbia, but then also at Queens College, uh, the City University of New York until 2001. She was two times a visiting professor at uh, Princeton University. Um, one 
kind of different uh, position was uh, she worked as an associate director of the Leo Beck Institute uh, in the 1980s, where she is currently on the advisory committee. And uh, I say this or uh, mention this because I have a personal kind of relationship. When I was doing my PhD, uh, this was shortly after the wall came down. Uh, my first uh, trip to the United States was actually funded by a fellowship, half of fellowship, I have to say, by uh, <laughs> uh, the UAC Institute. And this was um, which really brought testimony uh, into my studies because uh, uh, the archive of the UAC Institute uh, is a profound archive of testimony, of personal autobiographies, memories. Uh, letters, and uh, which was influential also for my uh, PhD on Jewish forced labor. But back to Marion Kaplan, she is the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, for example, just to mention re more recent ones, 2014, the uh, US Holocaust Memorial Museum, JP and Morris Shapiro Senior Scholar in Residence Fellowship. Um, she got uh, a 2016 Holocaust Educational Foundation Distinguished Achievement Award in Holocaust Studies, which is a really rare uh, uh, prize. Um, and I want to mention that she uh, managed to get not one, not two, but um, I think more than five or six book prizes, which is extraordinary uh, if you uh, think about um, this accomplishment. One was the um, Frankel Prize uh, in 1998 for unpublished book manuscript. Another was uh, the Central European History Book Prize. But more importantly, she won three uh, uh, National Jewish Book Awards with her books. And uh, this is just a testament to how important her work uh, was. She started her career writing about the role of women, especially uh, Jewish women in German history, from the imperial period to Nazi Germany. Uh, her early book was The Jewish Feminist Movement in Germany, The Campaigns of the Jewish uh, uh, Women's League. Um, but for me, uh, personally, uh, back in Germany, uh, uh, her contribution to a book uh, published in 1984, when bio biology became destiny, Women in Weimar and Nazi Germany, was especially influential, which kind of changed the course of how women were studied in German history. So this was an important contribution also on, uh, on a personal level for me. Um, but the most important book for me um, and for many other people uh, is the path-breaking book from 1998, Between Dignity and Despair, Jewish Life in Nazi Germany, where she really dives into uh, how women uh, experienced uh, the persecution of the Jews in Germany. Uh, and she did this, uh, and here's the connection to the Lubeck Institute, on the basis of this profound archive of uh, testimonies, personal memories of women. And she not only looks into the role of women and gender there, but she also looks into the role of um, and the change of family life under persecution. Uh, this book is very influential still, 20 years later, um, and it is uh, taught in many classrooms, including mine, so all my students can test the uh, uh, testament to that they have to read at least part of it. Um, um, but moving on, um, she in this book, Dignity and Despair, there is a topic already looming, which is uh, immigration of the Jews, the forced immigration of German Jews uh, during the Nazi period, which kind of motivated, I think, uh, a lot of her later books, uh, especially uh, the book on the um, refugees in the Dominican Republic, Jewish um, Dominican heaven, the Jewish refugee settlement in Sosua. And this might sound a little bit familiar because uh, during this uh, last year, there was a lot of mentioning also in the press of the uh, kind of failed uh, conference of Ibiyan, where uh, 32 countries came together to talk about the acceptance of Jewish refugees. And in the end, nobody really uh, opened the doors, except the interesting case, at least uh, on a planned level was the Dominican uh, Republic, which was under a dictatorship, uh, which is uh, quite ironic, uh, which planned to uh, accept 100,000 Jews. Um, Marion uh, shows that this never played out as it was planned, but uh, a few hundred made it to the Dominican Republic, and there is a story which you still can see uh, kind of the remnants today in the Dominican Republic. 
Um, her current book uh, kind of contributes to the same uh, line of topic. Uh, her newest book is uh, called, I hope the title is still, title is still right, Jewish, Jewish Refugees Fleeing Hitler, Hope and Anxiety in Portugal. 1940 till 1945, which is uh, about to be published very soon with the Yale University Press, focusing on another very unknown story uh, where many Jews from Europe try to kind of flee via Portugal. And uh, as always, she kind of assembles a lot of individual stories to en en enlighten us about the uh, experiences. So as you have seen, her uh, academic record uh, is kind of really pushing forwards two uh, themes. One is uh, the role of women on gender, uh, and then Jewish daily life, uh, which she published on also other books, not just about the Nazi period. Um, but I want to kind of come to her so that you can actually benefit from <laughs> what she has to say, because she has so many merits, I can't really. Uh, 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 kind of list them all. I just wanted to say that she also has a public role as an historian. She is an, on advisory committees for the Committee of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, uh, the uh, New York Center for Jewish History, and she is on the, the editorial board of the German, Jewish Women's Archive. So please give a warm welcome to Mary Catherine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you have to do what? I'm just pointing up here. Oh, okay. Okay, that's good. You want to make it bigger? Okay, I want to thank all of you for being here. And I also want to thank the, all of the people from the Shoah Foundation who have made a, a really welcoming and, and lovely week for me here as I was working on depressing topics. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, the first thing I'm going to talk about then is the early questions about women in the Holocaust. Looking back on the past three decades of historical studies on Jewish women in the Holocaust is no small task. Um, by the early 1990s, the field of women in the Holocaust had just begun. My own interests, stemming from my family history, my parents had been refugees from Nazi Germany, and from my earlier engagement with the women's movement as a graduate student at Columbia University, led me to this field. It took a while for me to gain the courage to address Jewish women and families in Nazi Germany. It felt too close. Still, as with my other scholarship, I wondered, might women have experienced this era differently from men? And if so, how? The early pioneers of this field assumed yes, but we needed to do the research. I'll start there, but first a historical reminder. 1980s feminists may have propagated the agenda, but questions about gender rose long before, although we didn't know it at the time. Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum's collection of testimonies, reports, and surveys in the Warsaw Ghetto from 1939 to 1943 later known as Oneg Shabbat, asked questions of and about women, and many of the collectors were women. Polish Jewish historian Philip Friedman, who survived Lvov in hiding, set an agenda for future research as early as 1945, later published in his book Pathways to Extinction, including the biological impact of starvation, statistics of biological destruction, the disintegration of the family, post-war medical and psychological exams of all survivors, all of which implied, at the very minimum, gender and generational analyses. The first large-scale research impetus came in 1983. Now I have to figure out the PowerPoint. Okay. It was coordinated by Joan Ringelheim and Esther Katz in New York City entitled Women Surviving the Holocaust. This is Joan Ringelheim. They wanted to find out if and how gender would have mattered. At points, um, there were about 400 people, survivors, some scholars, uh, mostly women scholars, two male scholars, uh, for who met for two days. 
uh, for, for a few of those sessions, we broke into small groups. And I had the opportunity of taking notes in one of these survivors' groups. Now, they were mostly women survivors, a few men. I recall my surprise and confusion when many survivors both rejected the salience of gender and at the same time highlighted it. In other words, these older women claimed being a woman didn't matter and then described how indeed it had mattered. I thought then and still think today that many survivors did not want to support a feminist inquiry and yet hoped to tell their stories for posterity. That same year, Vera Laska, and she's sitting there with the glasses looking very intense, um, <laughs> who herself was a survivor, published her Women in the Resistance and the Holocaust using women's already published testimonies, but that was really the first book. Twelve years after that first foray, Dahlia O'Fair and Leonor Weitzman organized the International Workshop on Women in the Holocaust at the Hebrew University. Oh, this is still the survivors. This is uh, Ilse Blumenthal Weiss, who was a poet who survived in Theresienstadt. Um, the International Workshop on Women in the Holocaust at the Hebrew University met in 1995. Why did it take so long? The short answer, we had to do the research that connected women's history, feminist theory, and the Holocaust. This took time. In the 1990s, for example, Lessons and Legacies of the Holocaust, published by the Holocaust Education Foundation, offered just two articles about women in the whole decade of the 1990s. Uh, one of them was by Claudia Kuhns, and I'll get to that in a minute. Scholars' focus on Jewish women caused some opposition in the 1990s, part of a conservative backlash against feminism. A few critics even lumped feminist historians with Holocaust deniers accusing feminists of using the Holocaust for their own agendas. Specifically, these critics saw a gender analysis as, quote, privileging women, that is, raising women's suffering about, above that of men, and maintained that women's experience were irrelevant or even irreverent. Thankfully, this debate died down quickly. Indeed, women's historians had always underlined that being Jewish mattered first and foremost. But as Joan Ringelheim wrote, quote, the end, namely annihilation or death, did not describe the process. Mary Felstener, another early scholar, specified that, quote, along the stations toward extinction, each gender lived its own journey. I added rather defensively, but probably appropriately for 1998, that, quote, to raise the issue of gender can never place blame on other survivors for the disproportionate deaths of Jewish women. Blame rests with the murderers. To raise the issue of gender also does not place it above racism. We know that the Nazis did not want to, quote, share the earth with the Jewish people. However, gender helps to tell a fuller, more intimate, and more nuanced story. It gives Jewish women a voice long denied them and a perspective long denied us. And I believe that to this day. Research on Jewish women didn't occur in a void. American and European women's historians began publishing on a wide variety of topics linked to women's history. For example, Becoming Visible, Women in European History, which went through three editions over 25 years. Historians also began to explore women in Nazi society. Tim Mason, an English historian of Germany, grew interested in German non-Jewish women in the mid-70s. And in the 1980s, this book, Mothers in the Fatherland, by Claudia Kuhns, as well as this book, which was uh, edited by Renata Breidenthal, Atina Grossman, and myself, uh, researched German women. But we also included, both Claudia's book and our book, included Jewish women in these histories, but separately. My own work, therefore, coincided with and was greatly influenced by the scholarship of women's history as well as the entry of women into academia. How did we write these histories? First, we needed to discover materials in newspapers, government, and organizational archives. But many of us also turned to memoirs, and that's what Wolf just pointed out, uh, diaries, letters, and interviews as crucial first-person evidence. 
reapplying the feminist motto, the personal is political, many historians insisted that the personal was also historical. That without women's memories, we missed half the story of the Holocaust. More specifically, without women's memory, we missed the family and domestic aspects of the Holocaust, but also the gendered public behaviors and humiliations, as well as gendered persecutions in ghettos and camps. Indeed, a recent historian concluded that diaries and memoirs dating from the war and post-war years are the two major sources regarding pregnancy, birth, and sexuality. In addition, comparing personal testimonies of both Jewish women and men makes gender an obvious, really an inescapable lens. The conference I mentioned in 95 opened a new research avenue. Um, let me see if I can just, there are too many papers here. I'm gonna put this down here. Uh, this is the, the book that came out of that conference in 1995 at the Hebrew University. Um, most of the topics focused on women rather than comparative gender, but some did that as well. These themes set the stage for the next 20 years of studies. Researchers, and myself included, benefited from the topics raised at this particular event. And the sources suggested there, and the creative energy that was bursting from this conference. Um, the, the Ofer and Weitzman book that you're looking at, Women and the Holocaust, came out three years later, as did Judith Baumel's Gender and, Hol and the Holocaust. This brings me to the topic that I delivered at that conference, out of which grew my book that Wolf has foisted on so many students here. <laughs> um, and which um, is, as he said, still in use. Now I turn to that research and highlight a few of my major findings at that time. So this is about gendered suffering and survival strategies in that period. This is Judith Baumel's book. I'm not very good at this PowerPoint, sorry. And this is the book that you just saw the cover of before. Although the calamity that hit German Jews affected them as, them as Jews first, they also suffered based on gender. At first, Jewish men were far more vulnerable to physical assault and arrest, and women remained to carry the burden of maintaining their homes and families. Even if ultimately Jewish women were also, quote, enemies doomed to perish in the Nazis' race war. Not only was early Nazi racism and persecution gendered, so too were the victims' survival strategies in both practical and psychological terms. The victims reacted not only as Jews, but as Jewish women and men. A focus on women led me to recognize, for example, that in contrast to men, most women took the early warning signals of Nazism more seriously than men adjusting to the abrupt changes in law and culture imposed by the party and embraced by many non-Jewish Germans. Women eagerly trained for jobs and crafts useful abroad, whereas men hoped that they would be able to maintain their careers or professions in Germany. And at home, women made do on smaller budgets, shopped in hostel stores, and tried to create cheer in cramped spaces while husbands were asked only to limit their expectations. Finally, many women became breadwinners, often for the first time, as husbands lost their businesses and jobs. Gender made an enormous difference in deciding between fight and flight. In the early years, Jewish women were more sensitive to discrimination, more eager to leave Germany, more willing to face uncertainty abroad. Jewish men thought they had, and had, a great deal more to lose by fleeing. Over 80% of Germany's approximately 525,000 Jews lived solid middle-class lives. These men had to tear themselves away from their life work, whether a business or a professional practice. Usually more educated than women, many men felt a deep attachment to German culture. And additionally, many had fought in World War I, and these veterans believed that their service and patriotism would count for something. Most importantly, since middle-class men had previously been the breadwinners, as long as they made a living, they were unwilling to face poverty abroad. In light of men's primary identity with their occupation and their breadwinner status, 
they often fell trapped into staying. Women whose identity was more family-oriented struggled to preserve what was central to them by fleeing with it. Ironically, those men whose businesses declined in the early period as a result of Nazi boycotts um, or who lost their jobs after the April laws um, of 1933 forced them out of their jobs, the irony here is that they lost their jobs so they felt they could flee. So some of those people who earlier lost their jobs actually wound up in safety. By April 1938, 60% of all businesses that Jews had owned before 33 no longer existed. Still, until November 1938, some of the men who had not lost their jobs or businesses hung on, hoping the regime would collapse or become less radical. In addition to different experiences in the world of work, men and women also led relatively distinct lives and interpreted daily events differently. Women were integrated into their communities. They noticed daily interactions with neighbors, regular exchanges with the grocer, participation in local women's groups. Raised to be sensitive to social situations, women's social antenna were finely tuned and also directed toward more unconventional, what men might have considered more trivial sources of information, what the baker said, whether the neighbor gave her usual good morning greeting. A widespread assumption that women lacked political acumen, stemming from their primary role in the family, often gave women's warnings less credibility. And the prejudice that women were, quote, hysterical in the face of danger worked to everyone's disadvantage. Many men insisted that they were more attuned to political realities. They claimed to see the broader picture to maintain a, quote, objective stance. When Elsa Gerstel urged her husband, a former judge who had lost his job, to emigrate, he responded, the German people, the German judges, would not stand for much more of this madness. Men often mediated their experiences through newspapers and broadcasts, whereas women's narrower picture, the minutia, and I would add significance, of direct contacts every day, brought politics home. Women also seem to have been acutely aware of their children's unhappiness, another reason to flee. When children suffered from abuse at school, mothers and fathers often disagreed as to the solution. Tony Lessler, who was the founder and director of a Montessori school in Berlin, which had become a Jewish school, remembered, quote, the city schools became ever more difficult for the children. If the parents had only guessed what the children had to go through, and it must probably have been a false pride that caused the fathers, in particular, to keep their children in city schools. Lessler pointed not only to fathers' aspirations to give children a quality education, but also to their stand-tough approach. Memoirs furthermore attest to fathers' unrealistic hopes that their children would not suffer and to their insistence that the kids develop a thicker skin. Recalling debates within Berlin Jewish families like his own, Peter Wyden summed up, quote, it was not a bit unusual to, in these go or no go family dilemmas for the women to display more energy and enterprise than the men. Almost no women had a business, a law office, or a medical practice to lose. They were less status conscious, less money oriented than the men. They seemed to be less rigid, less cautious, more confident in their ability to flourish on new turf. Finally, I noticed that women's perspectives highlighted entirely new public-private dimensions of history. For example, men wrote of the public spectacle of the November pogrom, smashed shops and burning synagogues, the lasting images of broken glass in the street. A powerful image mentioned often in Jewish women's memoirs, and we saw one in that um, clip, is that of flying feathers covering internal spaces, the home, the hallway, and the courtyard. Similar to pogroms in Russia at the turn of the century, the marauders tore up goose feather blankets and pillows, shaking them into the rooms, out the windows, down the stairs. Bereft of their bedding, Jews lost the kind of physical and psychological security and comfort that represented. In addition, Jews could no longer replace these items due to their cost and also because the looming war economy severely limited linens. Broken glass in public and strewn feather beds in private 
spelled the end of Jewish family security and family life in Germany. Gender differences in perceiving danger accompanied gender role reversals in what Raoul Hilberg described as communities of men without power and women without support, we find, for the most part, anxious but active women who early on greatly expanded their traditional roles. Many experimented with new behaviors rarely before attempted by any middle-class German women, for example, interceding for their men with the authorities and seeking paid employment for the first time. I'll have to give you two examples, which will have to suffice. The first focuses on the November pogrom of 1938, highlighting women's activities under dire circumstances. While destroying Jewish property, the marauders also beat and arrested over 30,000 men, interning them in concentration camps. There were exceptions. Some women were publicly humiliated, beaten, and murdered. But most women were forced to stand by and watch their homes and shops torn apart and their men abused. Later, women summoned the courage to overcome gender stereotypes of passivity in order to find any means to free men from camps. Oh, this is wrong. That's wrong. That's right, Ruth Abraham. OK, sorry. Um, Ruth Abraham impressed her family, but also the Nazis, with her determination and bravery. During the November pogrom, it was she who pulled her fiancé out of his store and led him through the teeming crowds. She then traveled to Dachau to ask for the release of her future father-in-law. Arriving in a bus filled with Hitler's elite troop, the SS, she entered the camp where she was ignored. She assumed that was because of her, quote, Aryan looks. She was tall, had blonde hair, and blue eyes. Although you don't see that here, but that is what she describes. She requested an interview with the, command, the commander and begged for the release of her elderly father-in-law. And she succeeded, again attributing her success to her looks, since the men who helped her refused to believe that she was a full Jew. And that's in quotes. Abraham's highly unconventional behavior found a more conventional reward. The couple married immediately. The rabbi who performed the ceremony did so with bandaged hands an indication of the treatment he had received in a concentration camp. The second example focuses on women, women making family decisions. In the aftermath of the pogrom, women no, not only arranged the release of loved ones, but also sent their children abroad. On the kinder transports, they sold property and they also made emigration decisions. Accompanying her husband home after his ordeal in a camp, one wife announced that she had just sold their house and bought tickets to, of all places, Shanghai for the whole family. Her husband reflected in his memoir, anything was okay with me, only not to stay in a land in which everyone had declared open season on us. Similar expressions of thankfulness, tinged perhaps with a bit of surprise and women's heroism, can be found in many men's memoirs. They continued to be indebted to women even after their ordeal, when many men, too beaten in body and spirit, could not be of much use in the scramble to emigrate. Traditionally, men had publicly guarded the honor of the family and community. Now suddenly, women found themselves in this difficult position. Even though women transcended certain gender roles, gender as such caused serious consequences in emigration. Gender made a difference in matters of life and death. For example, more women than men remained trapped in Nazi Germany. While there are many explanations for this, including male deaths in World War I, a higher number of widows, the intention of men to emigrate first and then bring their families over when they had settled, and so on, it's also clear that more men got out before the doors were shut, through business connections, capitalist visas to mandate Palestine, or because they were in physical danger earlier than women, and many women sent them out first. The disproportionate number of elderly women whom the Nazis murdered suggests that gender and age were a lethal combination. This then was my early research looking at the grassroots, at daily life, and at the quotidian responses of German Jews. I found that genders often perceived and reacted to the same events differently. 
and gender could also be a matter of life and death. When we observe grassroots developments, we see clearly that the public and private lives of Jews often varied in accordance with gender. Now, what happened in the next 20 years? To this day, there seems to be a good deal of social history and women's history, including local histories of Eastern and Western Europe and histories of camps and ghettos. Often these social and women's histories include women, but are not consciously about gender. If we approach topics in a gendered way, might it change our narrative? Holocaust historians rarely ask how women experienced aspects of the Holocaust differently from men, or how this might change our understandings. Literary scholars do this more often. They ask gendered questions of their texts, whether autobiographies or fictions. They come to the text with a particular interest in gender and women. But fewer historians seem to go beyond including women. Still, some promising research in Holocaust history has appeared lately. I can't go into all of it, but we'll mention two areas for today. New work on Eastern Europe and on the topic of sexuality. I'll start with histories of Eastern Europe. For example, there is new work on women inside and outside the Krakow ghetto, which included the family life of Jewish women and women's str strategies of survival within the ghetto and on the Aryan side, and that in contrast to that of men. There's also new research on women in bunkers in hiding and families in bunkers in hiding, social roles in ghetto conditions, more testimonies and literary perspectives as well as cultural studies, and work on individual women like Rachel Auerbach of the Warsaw Ghetto based on her diary and literary work. In addition, autobiographies have flourished. In 2009, Louise Vasfari gathered 400 entries of women's life writing from Central and Eastern Europe. And these are only the ones in English. So there are thousands. This was the result of a, quote, boom in such writings that occurred after years of mostly remaining unpublished by the women themselves or even refused by publishers. Research on sexualities and the body have made significant progress in the last, year, last years, mostly as women's history. Back in 1993, Claudia Schuppmann addressed how the Nazis targeted lesbians and we can find lesbians and the Holocaust noted in studies in the Shoah in 1999. But we need far more research, and taboos make this very difficult. Still, books about same-sex desire exist. I have used M.A. and Jaguar, which is also an interesting film, if you haven't seen it, um, in teaching, and will translate parts of a relatively new book in the series called Jewish Miniatures that focuses on another couple, Marta Halusa and Margaret Liu. Uh, the Jewish Miniatures is written in German, so I had to translate little parts of it. Also, queer history in and of itself, as well as how that research can answer questions about women's lives in extreme, should be addressed, though these topics get harder to research as time passes since the numbers were much smaller than the general survivor's population to begin with, and then their taboos. Endangered as Jews, women also experienced sexual vulnerability. Sexual violation often started with sexual humiliation, nudity, and shaving. Anthropologists have pointed out we, that, we, that we need to understand violence is not solely physical, but is an attack on humanity the personhood of individuals. In camps, for example, many daughters had never seen their mothers undressed, and then in front of male guards. Nor had most women ever shaved their heads. One survivor wrote of the blow to her morale after such a shaving, quote, we could have been shot, gassed, and yet the single act of German brutality constituted a sacrilegious act on our bodies, our only possessions. This may have affected religious women even more due to their strict upbringing regarding modesty and nudity. Men too were shaved, but in general spoke far less about that or worried about nudity. The sexual economy and sexual barter during the Holocaust needs further exploration. Anna Heikova's work on Theresienstadt, for example, 
highlights the power dynamics of unequal relationships, but is also stymied by taboos. Many survivors, male and female, saw women's sexual victimization as a stigma to be concealed. The film, Long is the Road, shot on location in a Jewish DP camp in Germany in 1947, offers a powerful example of this. In it, the young woman wants to confide to her male partner about something that happened to her during the war. But the man gently hushes her and tells her that it's better to forget. Viewers understand both that he hopes she will stop thinking about her trauma, assumed to be sexual barter or rape, but also that he doesn't want to know. If or when there was sexual barter, how do we understand this? Is it a choice? Is it a choiceless choice? Perhaps the memoir of Marie Jalowitz Simon, published just a few years ago in 2015, can offer some clues. Born to a middle-class Jewish family in 1922, she was only 20, young, slight, and pretty when she decided to go underground in 1942. Luckily, some non-Jews helped her throughout her subterfuge as a half-Jew. She was actually a full Jew, but she had papers that claimed she was a half-Jew. But her sexual relationships with men made a significant difference in her survival. Her first situation meant having sex with the husband of a woman who had just taken her in. Quote, I just let him have his way and left in two days. The next man who sheltered her, a Bulgarian painter, fell in love with her and offered to take her to Bulgaria. She agreed, hoping to make her way to Palestine from there, but the plans fell through. Still, she spent safe weeks with this man, whom she thought of as her lover, although she realized they would never have a future together if she survived. She also bartered sex for a, quote, engagement, at least for an attempt at an engagement with another worker, someone who did not speak more than a few words of German, a relationship that lasted only one day. Luckily for her, one man who offered her a hiding spot confessed to her that he was, quote, no longer capable of any kind of sexual relationship. She was overcome, quote, by relief and jubilation. <laughs> Marie Simon also allowed a woman who sheltered her for several weeks to kiss her goodnight every night uh, and to caress her body on occasion. Her last relationship, two years long, involved a Dutch worker who had come to Germany on his own before the forced laborers and was an anti-Nazi. An intermediary told this ex inexperienced young man that Marie would be his, quote, sexual liberation and that she would keep house for him. She saw him as a safe haven. They lived as a couple, although he occasionally hit her, angry at her love of reading. But he could also be, quote, pleasant and considerate, and they had a lot to talk about with regard to the war. How do we analyze this story? I asked before, are these choices or choiceless choices? How do historians, even the victims, distinguish between forced and consensual relationships when the latter could mean the difference between life and death? I don't have an answer. The interesting and arresting part of Simon's story is that she understood her situation, bartering sex for safety, and still sometimes even liked the man she was with. In no sense did she see herself as purely a victim of these men, even when she let one of them, quote, have his way. She disliked her immediate circumstances with men, but survival remained foremost in her mind. She makes it clear that she was a victim not of these men, but of the Nazis. It has taken many years for scholars to publish about rape, not only because taboos exist uh, around this subject. Sarah Cushman wrote of the difficulties of representing, quote, sexuality without crossing the line to pornography. Yet she also reminded us of another historian, Elizabeth Heinemann's assertion that, quote, failure to investigate evidence that appears time and time again is 
in an academic sense, bad scholarship. In a moral sense, it disregards the imperative both to commemorate past victims and to prevent future atrocities. Sources were and are available, but complicated and scattered. Older testimonies do exist. Still, we need an ensemble of data from victims, witnesses, and perpetrators. To complicate matters further, much of the testimony is partial, and some is unclear or vague. Nazi documents, army cases, and post-war trials of perpetrators have their own issues, although they need to be used with care. Scholars Regina Mühlhauser, Zoe Waxman, and Beverly Chalmers, among others, have raised these topics and offered examples. I would argue that their work should not only be seen as specialized histories of rape during war, but as Holocaust scholarship. Further substantiating this notion, David Cesarani, in his 1,000-page book, The Final Solution, showed that almost every atrocity against Jews in Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Ukraine included rape and sexualized violence against Jewish women, sometimes from Germans, sometimes from their local collaborators. Who were the main perpetrators of rapes against Jewish victims? Research highlights the Einsatzgruppen and the Wehrmacht as perpetrators, particularly after the beginning of the War of Annihilation against the Soviet Union. Some of this information comes from later testimonies of German soldiers, since rapists often killed the victims to prevent incrimination of the perpetrators. Other German soldiers proved reluctant to talk about these events even after the war, either to avoid being seen as brutal or for fear of admitting to what the Nazis had termed Rassenschande or racial shame. Yet new research makes absolutely clear that we can't accept these excuses anymore of racial shame. Um, that th this racial shame did not as a rule inhibit sexual contact in the East. Inside Germany, courts treated this transgression harshly, but most soldiers got away with it at the Eastern Front. As Mühlhauser has pointed out, sexual violence, while seen as a crime against military discipline and racial purity, became, quote, a normal part of everyday warfare. And gang rape also strengthened loyalty, created bonds within the squadron. In other words, rape may not have been part of the Nazis' original genocidal plans, but figured in the continuum of violence, even near execution sites. Looking ahead, I would like to raise some further areas that need attention in both older and newer historical fields. Aryan women, women whom I have not discussed in this talk, but who many see as second tier agents of terror, to quote Doris Bergen, need further investigation despite the good work already done. And I still consider interactions between Jewish and non-Jewish women a necessity. There have been only a few successful attempts so far, especially for women hiding, Jewish women hiding with women in Germany with non-Jewish women. I would also like to see more actual gender research, real contrast between women and men, and integrated history. In addition, by looking at race and class together with gender and sexuality, for example, we uncover the imbalances of power relations between men and women in public and private the different factors that help men and women survive, and the breakdown of social and cultural norms among Jews and non-Jews, often with regard to how women are treated. We can also learn how class or ethnicity was expressed through gender roles in ghettos and camps, or forced labor, or in hiding or passing. This would include masculinity studies as well. There has been important research on women's bonding experiences and camp sister relationships in extreme situations, but we need more and more comparisons with men. We have seen young girls adopted by young female strangers or by girls from their hometowns. Camp sisters tried to stay together, giving purpose to their lives and protecting each other as long as they could. We have learned that women sometimes created fictive families, for example, Ruth Kluger's mother adopted a daughter in Auschwitz. The three survived together and remained a family once in the United States. How widespread was this? 
And do we find similar relationships among men besides Primo Levi, um, who has a very close relationship with his friend? I also see family histories as opportunities to highlight gendered reactions and gender roles when faced with persecution. Although family histories have sometimes eluded or ignored gender, newer histories are raising these issues. The history of mothering during the Holocaust also needs more attention. One camp survivor repeated almost as a mantra, I had a mother, I had a mother, Underlying, underlining how her mother made the difference between her life and death. How did mothers manage to feed, clean, or nurture children? How did they flee? For example, Lea Lazigo, with two children and a three-month-old infant, climbed the Pyrenees on foot in 1943 as she fled occupied France. How did they do this? The important issue here, besides the all-important one of survival, is that gender roles proved malleable. Women often performed roles expected of men and sometimes vice versa. We might also think about sites where women transgressed many familial and gender norms, as I already mentioned, for example, as housewives in Germany or as resistance fighters, but later returned to more traditional gender norms in post-war DP camps or when starting their new lives in new countries. Waxman concludes that, quote, gender was the last thing to survive the camps. It may have been the last thing to survive more generally. Historians' newfound interest in emotions open still more intimate avenues to explore. How did the victims make sense of their daily lives and how did they express it? How did they feel? We have often assumed we knew, but as we take memoirs, letters, diaries, videos more seriously, they inform us of frustration, of hope, of fear. After many visits to inhospitable consulates, one woman concluded in exasperation, it would have taken the pen of a Kafka to depict the world of visas in all its surrealistic absurdity, that of a Dostoevsky to render the nightmare of the petitioner's struggle for survival. Finally, in front of the American consul, a young man felt his knees, quote, trembling and shaking. What can we learn about gendered reactions? Did they flatten? Or did later memories of persecution and escape return to gender stereotypes? So what is to be done? Once the list of desired research is complete, the big job awaiting all of us Holocaust historians is the need for integration, the goal to integrate a gendered approach into mainstream Holocaust studies, to more fully incorporate women's life stories as a primary analysis, and to pay attention as well to Jewish men, who also experienced demasculinization, unable to support their families. Here I mean work like Doris Bergen's that seamlessly integrates gender into her war and, gen and genocide. I do not mean simply add women and stir, but the comparison between Jewish women and men, as well as the relationships between the two genders, as well as relationships within single-sex couples during Nazi persecution. And these observations must be integrated with class, geography, and age. For example, poor women in Warsaw had a much harder time than wealthier women, both in the ghetto and on the Aryan side. As much as we emphasize chance or luck with regard to concentration camps, we really need to explore who may have had better prospects. A woman who knew four languages, a nurse, doctor, or a seamstress, Finally, as broader genocide studies have taken other ethnic murders into account, and you do that so well here at the Shoah Foundation, we may learn from them, analyzing the gendered similarities and significant differences across time and national boundaries. A new book, Women in Genocide, just came out this past year by Alyssa Bemporat, uh, which was uh, the compilation of a conference on different genocides and women's reactions and experiences. We still have a lot to go. Since I always take the long view, I am optimistic we will get there, slowly but surely. Thank you.
much, Marion, and uh, now you have a chance to really ask uh, some questions to a trailblazer in this field. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> so I open the floor for comments or questions. I mean, so. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, I was thinking a lot about the idea of women's agency when you were talking about choices and choiceless choices. And I was wondering, is there a space for constrained choices or constrained agency, given the fact that their pathways were so limited in part because of their gender, uh, because of their sex and also gender norms that um, restricted them? And the conditions around them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that brings me back to Karl Marx, 1848, uh, the, um, famous statement where he says people make their own history but not under conditions of their own choosing. And that's certainly the case in terms of gender and in terms of, um, of the persecution that's following. The one place I'd see constrained, if I had to give you a quick answer right now, would be the kinder transports, right? You're separating from your children. You're sending them away. You don't know if you'll ever see them and some of them will never remember you because they're toddlers. And so that is a constrained choice, and that is an incredibly difficult choice. And some, I, some of these women had to make it on their own because their husbands were in camps. So I would say that would be one of the major constrained choices. Um, I think the sexuality, to me, seems more like a choiceless choice. You're doing it to survive. Mm -hmm. um, but in, I, I really recommend her book. I mean, it's an amazing book because some of the situations are more positive than others. So maybe those were more constrained choices and others were more choiceless choices. So I think it, it goes back and forth depending on the moment. Yeah. How difficult is it to distinguish between like um, if whether or not a specific story is a singular example versus if it's uh, like a more general example representative of a larger? That's a very good question. That's what historians do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you read dozens and dozens and dozens of stories and you begin to see certain light motifs. Or what um, I also do a lot is I, I see a general pattern and I describe it and I give voices because I love voices. But then I might also see the opposite and say, you know, in some cases this and this was, because not everybody's going to react in the same way. So you have to, you know, if you want to nuance it, you have to say and others saw it this way and some saw it another way. It makes it a more complicated narrative, but that's, that's our job, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to formulate this question. So with the Rosenstrasse pro protest in Berlin, um, the women protested the men who had been arrested. Um, generally speaking, the Nazis arrested the men first because they saw the women as being more passive or easier to get after the men were taken away. Had it been different, do you think the men would have protested the, their women being? Well, first of all, the women who are protesting are non-Jewish women. Okay, so that's, make, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews protesting might have been rounded up, beaten up, who knows what. Um, so I think that uh, this was the first attempt at, uh, not the first attempt, this was a major attempt at breaking up mixed marriages. Yeah. And so uh, they didn't expect the women to come out, that's for sure. Uh, but I don't think that Goebbels would have first attacked women in mixed marriages. That would have been bad publicity. That would not have worked so well, I think. So he got the men. And then the women came out and um, protested. And you know the story, so the protests get bigger and bigger. And it's not just women. It's also women and, and young men, children of these people who are, quote, you know, Michelin or mixed people. Um, so I think that uh, they wouldn't have put the women out, uh, uh, rounded up the women first. Uh, would the Jewish, would the non-Jewish men have come out? Probably, but the thing is the non-Jewish men were, the Jewish women married to non-Jewish men were in a privileged mixed marriage. They didn't wear the yellow star. They had certain privileges. So to attack them first would have alienated so many, quote, Aryans 
that that's why they invented the privileged mixed marriage. So I think because they didn't want to attack those women first. Had the war, had they won the war, who knows? But I, I think that that's the general answer I would give for that. Yeah. You talked about rape um, and how long it took the scholars in Holocaust studies to actually start studying it. So I'm thinking about the scholarship done uh, regarding other genocides, primarily Bosnia, for example, or Rwanda, and how short it took actually scholars to start studying rape uh, as an element of genocide in those contexts. So I'm curious, how, that, how do those insights gathered from those other genocides feature in Holocaust studies regarding rape? I'm not sure they have, but I think it's a really important avenue to look into. And not, I'm, I'm not just thinking Rwanda and Bosnia, but Bangladesh. Remember when the, the war and the, those, so many of those women were raped too. So the, I think it's probably a very important avenue to look at. But I'm also worried that it's too late for Holocaust studies. In other words, you have thousands of interviews here, some of which mention sexual violence. But um, how do you do that now? You go up to a 90-year-old woman and ask her if she's been raped. I mean, that's, whereas now we're much more conscious of this. We're much more conscious of rape in war as a, an act of war, right, as violence. I think it took a long time to come to th that notion as well, that rape is violence. Um, so I don't know if we could do it with Holocaust material today. It's awfully late. But that's why people like Mulhauser are using army records and different sources to find out. And the amazing stuff is what she's found out in the Eastern Front. I mean, I was surprised. I, you know, that's why I, I said now, you know, you can never say Russ and Shanda stopped them from raping because it's just nonsense. It, it did in, the, in, in Germany, you could get in trouble for that. Um, big trouble in some cases, but especially for the Jewish woman or the Jewish man. Um, but even the non-Jew could get in trouble, but not like in the East. It was, you know, just a common occurrence. So, and, and then they kill the victim, so it's very hard to, to find that. But even at execution sites, I mean, that's incredible if you think about it. Um, so, but your question's a really, really good question. I don't know how it could inform Holocaust scholarship today. It might just, what do you think? It might be too late. I'm always hopeful. Yeah, me too, <laughs> but, but it, it's, it's a, it would also m mean a, a liberalization and opening up of elderly women to talk about this, you know? That's, that could be hard. But even with reviewing old sources we already use with a different lens. That's true, that's you can see it, that's right, right. And I said that, they said there are old sources, exactly. but we, you know, we have skimmed over that probably. You're welcome. Yes. Can I just add a question that maybe a little bit of advice for those of us who are all historians. Um, as you look at these sources as a historian, what might we do better in terms of surfacing the conversation in interviews around gender, around sexual violence, and so forth? Any thoughts on that? Where you go, yeah. oh, I wish that, that had been asked, or I wish the methodology included this. Right, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think that you have to ask questions about, you know, let's say you're interviewing a woman, you, your brother, your mother, your father. Um, you know, and what happened um, in the bunker? Who got the food? Who went out? I mean, we know some of this, but you know, you, you have to really constantly be asking gendered questions. And then the other thing that's really interesting to me is class is almost never mentioned. We can read class when we watch the show of videos. We kind of know when, I'm, I'm looking at uh, domestic servants now who say, oh, when I was in England, I was a domestic servant. Uh, but at home we had a servant, so you can say, okay, this person is middle class, lower middle class, depending on if it's rural or urban, because rural pr people needed extra help around the house, and it was usually the neighboring girl, or it was your daughter or something. But, um, but you can tell by class right away that they feel a, a loss of class. Um, but I don't know, um, 
Cl class is also not mentioned very much. My father was a lawyer. Okay. Is he a lawyer in a little rural area? Is he a lawyer in a giant, not giant firm, German giant firms would have been 10 people at that time, you know, but is he a, a you know, is he, is he well known? Is he a Geheimrat or, you know, you have to ask those questions. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. My father was a lawyer, you know, or my father was a dentist. What does that mean unless you're, you know, you know where they come from or what they think of themselves? So that I've read lots and lots of memoirs where the person is really poor and they get a library card and they go to the library and then they get half price or standing room at a theater um, for production. They're poor, but they have total middle class aspirations and they become middle class and they write a memoir, which is, you know, what mostly middle class people write me memoirs. So it's, you know, what is your aspiration? Where do you come from? That kind of thing, you know, um, you just have to keep asking those questions. And, and that happened at that first conference I mentioned, where the women are sitting in the room saying, you know, there's nothing about, what, they were really mad at us. They came, but they were not happy with our questions. And they t gave us totally gendered responses. You know, this happened to me, my husband such and such. This happened to me, my brother such and such. It was amazing. Um, and the men also. I mean, I, I interviewed one man, I'll never forget it. He said to me, he had a heavy accent, women. What do you want to know about women? And I said, anything you can tell me about women, you know? And, and he was so sweet and he invited me to his house. This is in Washington Heights in New York for dinner. And he came up with a lot of stuff by telling me also about his father and brothers. In other words, they were really important. So. Um, in my middle class book, I have stories about fathers, you know, mother is lighting the candle, father is light, well, this is Gershom Scholem, the famous one, um, mother lights the candles, father lights his, cig his cigar on the candles. <laughs> so, you know, but you, get the, you get the gender differences in a lot of this stuff. Um, fathers have to work on Saturday, mothers are still cooking 24 hour meals so they don't have to turn on the light on Saturday. So you, you, you get it, you know, but you really have to look for it too. But asking questions, I mean, you just have to be a, a nudge and ask the same old questions over and over again. Yeah. Do you make recommendations about further areas of study? Um, but in terms of methodological questions around how best to get at those, using testimony, I wonder what your thoughts are. Of course, story, narrative is a, an important tool for understanding what history. Um, but to get at gender issues, how, how, do we, how do we position that and continue to sort of work to position testimony in ways that it's seen as valuable? It is, I'm not saying it's not, but to continue to cement that. And that, because what, what's interesting is that women's stories in, in and of themselves may not be seen as valuable. And here we are saying, well, there are women's stories in the archives. So it's almost sort of, like, it's a problem there. There's a tension there. Um, so how, how do we get in there in the, in the study of gender and, and place testimony where it belongs in a way where it is? That's a really hard I question. Think I think it's, it's a question also about our current culture and our current awareness, right? So that you can look at something 10 years earlier. I'm, I'm studying and thinking about emotions now and about sites of the Holocaust, sort of geographies of the Holocaust. Well, I've been looking at stuff like that for years and now I'm looking at, oh, they were in a cafe. What's happened in that cafe? Or, so it, it's a, a lot about cultural awareness, I think. The other thing, this may sound lame, but it makes sense to me is that our memories make history. So those memories are very important. And at some point, some new student, some young student will come in and look at it with different eyes. But if we don't put those memories down there, there is no history. So to that extent, I think you, know, you, you look at it with different eyes and fresh eyes. And, um, and it'll change. I mean, that's what's exciting about history, right? Because it keeps changing. We keep asking, we went from diplomatic and intellectual history to social history to women's history. You know, we've been moving on. And so that's a good thing, I think, you know.
Not that they have anything against intellectual history. <laughs> yeah. Um, even though we didn't ask you know, a lot of gender questions, maybe uh, in our interviews in the, in the archive, did you notice any general differences in the way women uh, told their <laughs> stories for the archive? And, and told differences in the way women gave their testimonies versus men? You know, after I, I started. <laughs> it's a little distracting. <laughs> I would have started off by saying some of the women broke down a little bit, cried a little bit, but the men did too. So I didn't see a whole lot of difference there. But I think women do provide more of the materiality, the textuality of, of uh, everyday life. Like really, so th I was telling Stephen about a, uh, one of my favorite interviews here, which is a woman whose last name is now Finger. Um, but she, was, she and her family were walking through Spain because they were illegal and they were trying to get to Portugal. And it took them several months to walk through Spain. And they slept at night in stables because the breath of the cow warmed them. It was December. Now I don't know if that would have been something a man would have noticed, maybe yes, but she is so uh, material about everything. She hears the sound of a dog barking and it breaks her heart because it reminds her that they, as they are struggling through Spain, there are people living normal lives going, and she says, going to bed under sheets and with, you know, parents giving them a meal before di you know at dinner time, so it's very concrete in a daily way. I mean, I don't know. This may be gendered. I'm thinking of like walking into a kitchen with my husband, anybody's kitchen, and I will know where to go for a plate or for a cup, and he'll go, "Where's the plate? Where's the cup?" And I'm like, "Look, you know, it, it, it's it's that kind of thing where you're trained in some ways to just understand." the materiality of your life. And that could, that's socialization. It's not like guys couldn't do that, right? But it's just that in the interviews you have, those people probably were brought up in a more gender segregated way. So if I want to look for really dense detail, I, I find it more with women. But not the emotional stuff, which you might have thought. Oh, sorry. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, at the end of your talk, you posed the question of, you know, who may have had better prospects. And I was wondering uh, this idea of beauty or standard of beauty at the time uh, may have played a role, um, a gender specific role, because you were talking about underground in Berlin of how like these women are pretty and these women were uh, Aryan looking. So yeah, I was just wondering if that's something you've seen often. Uh, well, what I've seen in? often is that women underground dyed their hair blonde. <coughs> that was very important. There's a new film out, I don't know if you've seen it yet, called The Invisibles. It's about four, it, I just saw it in New York about three or four weeks ago. Um, it's about four people who hide underground in Berlin and succeed. So they, they have, it's like a docudrama, you know, they have actors doing it, but then they interview the actual survivors. And so part of it was about not just, and Nahama Tech talks about this too in her book Dry Tears, not just about looking blonde, but about not looking scared, about not acting frightened. And that seemed to have played a really important role. And Ruth Abraham, whose pictures I, I showed earlier, she was very gutsy. And that's an amazing story, because she was pregnant, and a blonde woman came up to her, an, an actual Aryan came up to her, and said to her, gave her some food, and said to her, when you have the baby, you can give it to me. Now here's a constrained choice. This was a woman out of nowhere, okay? and she decides that she's got to do that. And she gives the baby to this woman. 
and um, she continues with her blonde hair. She, a lot of them talk about their blonde hair. Um, th th these were real blondes, but there are a lot of them who dyed their hair blonde too. Um, and that that was their way of passing. And she survives and her baby survives and her husband survives. They all split up because you can't, you could, it wasn't as easy to survive together. So, um, and, and I met the baby who lives in New York and it's an amazing story. They actually published it um, from a private press. Maybe you even have it in your, in the library. Um, it's a very good book, yeah. I say it a little louder. Um, I was wondering about gender in children's experiences. So, like in the ghetto, there was a difference in how um, boys and girls. Uh, boys and girls, yes. And how they sense of what was happening. <sighs> There's not that much research on it, but right here, um, there is the story of Pincus, who is the what do you call it? The visual interactive, interactive testimony. And he talked, he's, he was a twin, and he was 11, and he survives, and his sister was murdered right away. So it looked, because they probably assumed boys could work, or boys were a little stronger, he was a little taller. So it, that, there's that aspect, which is a lot of girls were seen as, not, as useless workers. Um, I don't know enough though about the schools. I'm trying to think there were, you know, hidden ghetto schools. I don't know, I would assume they were boy and girl, but I don't know enough about that to say. Um, and I also don't know whether survive, I would assume survival was better for boys than for girls. But that's an assumption. I don't have the statistics. Yeah. Um, regarding the experience of lesbian women during the Holocaust, how um, would you say they were able, like how did they cope with their sexuality and how did they Well, in the case of M.A. and Jaguar, um, M.A. is married to an SS officer or something, so she's got five kids, so she's, they're okay. And it's all hidden, it's not outdoors. You're not walking around arm in arm, you know, as lovers, but it was hidden. Um, the Claudia Shupman book really tells the story of uh, lesbians who hid their identities. But lesbians as such were not persecuted for their sexuality, they were called asocial, uh, but they were not, male homosexuals were really targeted. And uh, female homosexuals were far less interesting to the Nazis. And I, I'm not sure why, I mean, I, I've read certain things where Nazis felt that if she, were, if she meets the right guy, she'll change. I mean, that's kind of silliness, but, but I think that that was kind of a, an uneducated attitude, um, but they were not really persecuted as lesbians. And again, the, there's the film M.A. and Jaguar is fabulous because the lesbians also go to hotels. This, it's based on a true story. M.A. and Jaguar and is based on a completely true story. But um, they go to hotels where the army's standing around and where they're flirting with the guys so that they can sort of be out and have a drink and go for coffee and, and they're very, you know, nice looking women, but they're playing a joke on these guys. And so it's also interesting how they play with the um, persecution. So it's, it's a good film. I think we have to slowly wrap up, maybe the last question. Um, so during the Weimar period of Germany, um, wasn't it true that there was like more um, like sexual ex uh, expression and freedom? And so how did like, all of a sudden, like the Third Reich takes power, and all, like all that, like shuts down. But how do you, um, people who were used to like living their lives um, deal with the new uh, standards? Okay, so Weimar, there is a lot of sexual experimentation. There's cabaret. There's a lot of sexuality out in the open. It's Berlin. Okay. It's not the villages. It's, you know, it's Berlin, and Berlin is a fabulous city. It's an exciting city at that time. Um, but it's not like it's spread so widely. And so I would say there is a very conservative element in Germany as to how women should behave or how men should behave. 
that, um, and, and a very strong religious, sort of Christian religious morals crusade at the same time in Weimar. I mean, they were clashing all the time. So I think that, uh, you know, the backlash was always there. It just was, Hitler was able to foment it and to say, we'll clean up the streets and we'll end prostitution, which he didn't do. Um, you know, but the, to, to make all those sounds as though he was going to make it a more moral nation um, and seeing Weimar as degenerate sexually and degenerate because, quote, Jews ran it and things like that, so connecting degeneracy and Jew, Jewishness as well. But it really wasn't as free as, as if you see the movie Cabaret, it's not all Cabaret. <laughs> Thank you for your good questions and for your interest. Thank you. I thought you said to stop.